Uh, well, good evening. I'm Matt Stanford. I usually introduce the speaker, but I am the speaker tonight. So uh, I'm the CEO of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, role of faith and spirituality and mental health, which is a, a big topic around here that we deal with every day. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, I, um, I was prior to coming to the Hope and Healing Center in January, I'd been a professor at Baylor and Waco for the last 12 years in psychology and neuroscience. And one of my main areas of research for probably the last, I don't know, probably about the last 10 years has been uh, uh, psychology and issues of faith and how, particularly how the mentally ill interact with the local church. And I will talk about that a little bit as we go through here. Um, and then prior, prior to that, I was uh, at the University of New Orleans for 10 years, where I was a chair of the psychology department. And then prior to that, I did my postdoctoral work at the medical school here in Galveston. And so uh, my training is mostly in neuroscience, and I uh, studied uh, aggressive, aggressive and impulse control uh, problems, uh, and I've done that most of my career for 25 years plus. So most of the people I've ever seen were violent. So most of my clients are violent. So I work with inmates and domestic violent abusers and all types of things like that. So this is over the last 10 years has been quite a journey as I started to really look at psychology and issues of faith. So today I want to talk about uh, the role of spirituality and mental health. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit different uh, presentation than I have done in the past. I'm going to actually kind of tell you the kind of the reasons why we should incorporate of faith and spirituality and the kind of the evidence that goes along with that. And then I'm going to kind of lay out for you a, uh, a mental health initiative that we're going to be starting next year to try to kind of uh, fundamentally alter the way people interact with the mental health care system uh, here in the Houston area to try to make it a more accessible and, and useful system. So to begin with, you know, when we're talking about mental health, I know I'm not supposed to, I'm, I have these markers that I'm supposed to stay in between. This is very <laughs> difficult, actually. Uh, the to begin with, when we look at mental health, we have to understand that we're all on the continuum. So it's not an issue of us and them or those people that have that disorder and we don't have that disorder. We all are on the continuum. So uh, I'm going to walk over here and be where I'm not supposed to be for a minute. But, but you know, most of the time we're in here, you know, if we, if we don't have a serious mental illness. Uh, and we're just you're kind of in this well-being state and we might have some mild distress. You know, something terrible might happen, something joyous might happen, but we move back and forth in there. So there is movement on this. And then at some point, we might cross a line of distress in which we become significantly distressed, okay? Where we might describe that as moderately distressed, uh, but more distressed than just daily life events. And, and in that instance, we might actually, you could see where the mark is for mental health problems, we might actually have to get some assistance to help us kind of deal with that. Maybe you have a, a spouse that dies, or maybe you have a relationship that ends, or maybe a financial issue, or, or whatever the, it may be, but there is some significant uh, level of distress that causes you not to be able to really function effectively on a daily basis. And then there's another line where we cross over, and, and really I, I usually call that the disorder line. We cross over into overt mental illness. And so we have a mental illness. And if someone has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, uh, you know, they're in here. And now they can still, just because you're in here, doesn't mean you can't move back here if you have an illness. Uh, they are still struggling with the symptoms of that illness, but they certainly can not be in distress and be stable and be much more than stable, functional and purposeful in their life and doing very well. So we can move back and forth on this, okay? So as we talk about this, one of the things I will talk about as we move on is when people find themselves in distress and why then the faith and spirituality becomes kind of an important aspect of that. I would also say that when we're dealing with levels of distress, probably in this range and even, even up to either very close to the disorder line or, or just before it, most of the time, those levels of distress can be dealt with by what you would think of as laymen or people that are non-professionals. So a pastoral counselor or a lay counselor or, or someone that, you know, a friend that sits and talks with you, you, a lot of times that level of distress can be dealt with somebody that isn't have to have professional credentials. And that also will come into play as we go through. But when we look at spirituality and faith, there really are kind of three different aspects of why it's important that we incorporate it into mental health care. And, and I'm going to talk about each one of these. I'm also going to talk about kind of a, a negative or a drawback that goes with each one that's kind of been a barrier that has kept this from happening. So there are logistical issues, 
There's a logistical reason why we should incorporate this. There's a therapeutic aspect, and there's a spiritual aspect of why we should incorporate uh, faith and spirituality and why it's an important component of mental health care. And so I want to go through and talk about each one of these. And some of these may actually surprise you. I'm going to show you some different data that might be helpful to kind of show why this is important. All right, so first, and probably the most important logistical issue is this, and that is, People in psychological distress are more likely to go to a clergy before they ever go to any other professional group. Per that's particularly true in minority populations. The, uh, the, pop the frequency is even higher in minority groups. They're much more likely to go to clergy. Now, what's interesting about that statistic is that's been shown time and time again. It's been known for many, many years. Psychologists have known it forever. No one ever seemed to tell clergy that they... I mean, th there's this gatekeeper model, all these hundreds of articles written on this gatekeeper model where psychologists recognize that clergy are a gatekeeper, meaning that they are a first person that interacts with people with mental health problems. And then the thought is that they will recognize a mental health problem and they'll make a referral to a mental health care provider. When you ask clergy, they have no idea that they are a mental health gatekeeper. They don't even know about that. Uh, in fact, many clergy will tell you, I've never seen anybody with mental illness. Because people don't walk in the door and say, well, I got bipolar disorder. They walk in the door and they say, I s my, you know, my wife spent all of our money in two days. Like, this, this really happened to me. This was <coughs> a couple that I actually interacted with. The husband took the wife into the pastor. She spent all of our money in two days. And she literally had spent all of their money in two days. And, and when I say all their money, I mean all of their money, like tens of thousands of dollars. She bought a boat. She bought a couple cars. She bought golf clubs. She bought everything, Okay. And so the pastor felt that this was just an example of poor stewardship. And so he put her in a Dave Ramsey class at the church. Y'all know who Dave Ramsey is? He's the financial guru guy. He has a show on the radio. He talks about, you know, only paying cash for everything. And he has this kind of a class that's taught at a lot of places around uh, called Financial Peace University where you get out of debt and stuff. But really, that's a classic sign of bipolar disorder is this overspending with no thought of the consequences. She was in a manic state. Pastor didn't even pick up on it. Neither did the husband, okay? Suffice to say, Dave Ramsey doesn't make you better when you have bipolar disorder. He might help you get out of debt, but he can't help you with bipolar disorder. So the thing is, is that we'll talk about that, which is the over-spiritualization, but they went here first. They went to, and what's interesting about the statistic is it isn't just for religious subgroups within the greater population. It even is true for people who aren't people of faith. The data shows that even people that don't consider themselves people of faith are more likely to actually show up at a church before they go to a mental health care provider. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the stigma and shame that's associated is clearly a major driving factor uh, because I mean, part of it's just naivete. You don't recognize that you have a problem that's mental health necessarily, but you're much more likely to go talk to your pastor than you are because you've got to admit there's something wrong with you to go. Uh, and No, you're absolutely right. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's a, a really good point. So now, that being said, if we look at this is some data uh, that Amy Simpson has in a book that came out in 2013, and, you know, she had a sample of about, about 500 pastors that she interviewed. And you can see the, the fairly high number of pastors that are asked multiple times or interact multiple times throughout the year with people that specifically come to them because of mental health issues. This is an extremely common thing, okay? This happens all the time. And so one of the things that we found, unfortunately, is pastors are very ill-equipped to deal with this. But they are coming to the church first. So now, when uh, Lifeway Research is a, is a part of, a, it's kind of like a faith-based version of Gallup. They do these large surveys around the country every year, particularly in the context of religion. And this is a survey they did about a year ago uh, looking at the mental health issues. And then uh, these are asking Protestants with family members in households with acute mental illness, what types of things does their church offer in relationship to mental health? Because knowing that those families have more likely to be ones that actually went and ask for some type of assistance. And if you look, I mean, you can see that there's a broad set of things, which is interesting and, and good, 
but a very small number of churches even offer them. Some of the things that are most disturbing about this to me is something like this, host groups in your community such as NAMI that help the mentally ill. In fact, that's the lowest number on there, and that's the easiest thing for a congregation to do. I mean, that's one of the things we do here at the Hope and Healing Center. We host 35 support groups throughout the week. We have almost 500 people come through here every week going through our support groups. And many of the support groups, we just, what we do is we just offer a room for another organization to come in. and off We literally, all we have to do is keep the lights on. And then they, they run. Some of the groups we offer ourselves, but a church could have NAMI, DBSA, AA, I mean, you name it. They could just have one evening of the week where they just make their Sunday school rooms available. And they could have groups for hundreds of people, literally. But a small, and then, you know, the top provide training for leaders to identify symptoms of mental illness. Well, really, that's the key. If, if people are going to uh, churches first, the leadership, the people that are going to interact with them have to be equipped to recognize mental health problems. You can't expect a, a novice to recognize a mental health problem. I, I mean, that, you know, that, that would be like, well, the, you know, we trained the gas station attendant to, well, we can't expect him to do that if we didn't train him to do it. So if uh, only 11% are being trained, and 8% or less are uh, offering groups, then they're really not doing the simplest things they could do. Now, some of these other things, you know, you see maintain list of experts to refer people to. That's, you know, 28% or have a lay counseling ministry. Those things are great, but they're only great if they're effective and the people know about them. And what the research has actually shown is that while churches may offer those, uh, in, one, in one study done by these guys, 68% of churches said that they offered a referral list, but when the congregants of those churches were asked if they knew about it, only 28% of the church, e service e church even knew they existed. And so th they're not promoted. And the other thing is, think about this. You're in distress, and you show up at a, f a congregation because you're hoping to have help with distress, and someone hands you a piece of paper with a bunch of phone numbers on it. Uh, you know, when you're in distress, that's, number one, not very comforting, but number two, you usually can't make decisions very well in the context of your own care. Mental health problems are the only problem where the disordered organ has to make all the decisions for care, and you really need somebody to help you get to that care. So, so logistically, we know that people are going there first. Now, you, would s you should say to yourself, well, wait a minute. We know there's a mental health crisis. There aren't enough mental health care providers. People don't act. I'm going to show you some data in a few minutes. They'll just frighten you with the fact that the vast majority of people never receive any treatment for their illness. Um, well, if we know they're going to churches first, shouldn't we do something like train people? Shouldn't there be like a program to train faith communities to? No, nobody's, nobody's even done that. So there's no, been no systematic effort to do that, which is really odd to me. So now, secondly, so we have logistical issues. We know they're going there first, so that's where we should be looking. Uh, we know that most pastors don't make referrals. That's what the data has shown us. Very few pastors will make referrals, and when they do make referrals, they have a tendency to make referrals, particularly if you look at the data from Christian faith communities, to Christian counselors or faith-based counselors, which are certainly f great if who's being referred to them is someone they can deal with. Most Christian counselors, most faith-based counselors are uh, master's level counselors, LPCs, LMFTs, which are great. I have a good friend in Waco, when I used to live in Waco, I used to refer people, people with serious mental illness to her all the time. She was very good, really enjoyed working with people with bipolar disorder. She had a li licensed marriage family therapist, had a lot of extra training in that. But I had another friend who had LPC, and she said, please do not send me people with serious mental illness, because I, I don't, I work with, I'm like a marriage and family therapist, and I do some parenting work. I can't handle that. And so, that's another layer of concern here is, you know, you, you say, oh, well, I got this great Christian counselor, go to her, you know, but you have schizophrenia, and she does marriage and family issues and parenting. And so now when you go there, she says, well, I don't think I can really help you. Now it's, one le it's less likely that you're even going to be able to get the care now, because the more times you try to interact with the system and you kind of get a negative reaction, the less likely you are to be able to get through it. So now therapeutic reasons. There's been an enormous amount of, of research done, particularly over the last 10 years, looking at the effects of religious involvement and religious belief on health, particularly on physical health. Um, and so, but there's been more recently a lot of work done on actual mental health. And now what I'm not saying is this, okay? I'm gonna, in a minute, I'm gonna tell you that a lot of times these things are over-spiritualized. I'm not telling you if you just believe in God, you won't have mental health problems. What I am telling you, though, 
is that people who have certain beliefs in God and incorporate religion into their daily life, they do have better mental health outcomes than people who don't. Now, there's a lot of other variables in there, but this data is very, very interesting. So, for instance, if you look at the blue line, which is negative emotions, and you look at the green line, which is positive emotions, you can see here this is, uh, this is uh, involvement in, in church. Never, seldom, about once a month, every week, uh, at least once a week. So you can see the more that these individuals, and this is a big Gallup study that was done a few years ago, 2011. What's nice about all of this data that I'm going to show you here is it was done in random samples of the U.S. population that incorporated all faiths, even though it says church. These samples include Muslims, Jews, Buddhists. I mean, they, they include virtually all faiths, and it's a true random sample of the U.S. population. The data is consistent across faiths, so it's not like this faith works and that faith doesn't. It's the involvement that's important. So here you can see the more you're involved, the more positive emotions you have, the more negative, le fewer negative emotions you have. This is from a large study that was, is called the Baylor Religion Survey that's done every few years by the sociology department at Baylor. Again, it's a large random sample of the U.S. population across faiths. And what they found is that w using a, a set of items that I classified people as worriers or non-worriers, the more, the more involvement you have in your religious group, the more likely you are to be a non-worrier, okay? And so you can see that if you were never, never attended religious service, you're more likely to be a worrier. But if you attend religious services weekly, you're more likely to be a non-worrier. And those are kind of general, kind of when you talk about positive emotions, negative emotions, worrying, non-worrying. But some of this data is particularly interesting for mental health stuff. So for instance here, these are looking at specific mental health issues. And when I say that, I mean kind of diagnosable conditions like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, things like that, depression. And individuals, this is the percent report fewer reported. So if you believed I have a warm relationship with God, if you reported that to be true for you, you feel like you have a warm relationship with God, those people reported 31% fewer mental health issues. Uh, same thing with God knows when I need support, God is responsive to me, and God never fails me. What was early on thought particularly with the health data, and it still kind of holds up with the health data, physical health data, is just straight involvement with church. The more involved you are in your faith community, the more healthy you are. What we're finding with the mental health is it's not so much just involvement, but it's how you're, it's what you believe. Not, not, and I don't mean that from like you're a Christian or you're a Jew or you're, I mean what you believe about God and what, how you believe he is related to your life. And I'm going to show you some some of that data, which is really new stuff. So here uh, is a little bit kind of teasing at it. If we think God is very engaged in our life or God is very judgmental. So if you think God is very engaged, and this is going to be a consistent theme here, you actually have better mental health outcomes. So you can see here, these are actual uh, diagnoses here. So for generalized anxiety disorder, people that believed in a very engaged God reported 21% less generalized anxiety disorder. But if people, if you, if you believe in a very judgmental God, it actually gives you worse mental health outcomes. You're more likely to have social anxiety or compulsions, okay? And this is where we start to get into the idea of kind of how we see God versus uh, just going to church type of thing. Because if you think about it, what no one is saying is, well, you're unhealthy, so if you'll just start going to church, it'll go away. You'll get much healthier. Because, you know, we know that's not, it's, it's, not just going to church, it's, it's the thoughts that you're having. And so what we found is, and particularly from this Baylor Religion Survey data, but it holds up in the other also, is that really when you look at these large samples across faiths, people tend, and again, these are monotheistic faiths. You have to kind of pull out like Buddhist, which is an atheistic faith and things like that. But if you, you look at the monotheistic faiths, people fall into basically four categories across two dimensions. They see God as more or less engaged in their life and more or less judgmental of them, okay? And if, so if you see God as very engaged in your life and not very judgmental, so he's the, he's the Jesus is my homeboy kind of Jesus. You've seen that, you know, those shirts? And so he, he's your buddy, but he doesn't really judge you, okay? very much. He just loves you and doesn't judge you. That's the benevolent God, okay? And those people have very good mental health outcomes because they believe they are 
loved by a, a, a greater transcendence. They believe that a greater transcendence is not critical of them, and they believe that greater transcendence is actively engaged in their life. Okay, so what do you think that does? It reduces their stress significantly because they have more of what's thought of as an external locus of control. Things are happening outside of my control, so I don't have to worry about it. And I know God cares for me, okay? So I, I know he's going to be good. Authoritative God, God's more engaged in your life, but he's more judgmental. You would potentially think that that wasn't a good one, but that is actually a good one. Those people have just as good of outcomes as benevolent. In fact, the engagement dimension is what matters, not so much the judgmental dimension. The distant God, I'm going to skip critical God for a minute. The distant God, that's what, if you are familiar with deism, that would be like a deist God. You know, he wound up the world and set it on a shelf and he disappeared somewhere. And he's uninvolved in the, in the world. He's not engaged. And he certainly doesn't have anything critical or judgmental about you. So these individuals have just as good of mental health outcomes as these people do here uh, most of the time. Although, when push comes to shove, they will end up on the back side of this. But this doesn't seem to be overly detrimental to them. This, on the other hand, is the worst place that you can be. And that is the critical God. That is the unengaged God who's very judgmental. So he doesn't care about you enough to be involved in your life regularly, but he basically is throwing lightning bolts at you all the time. Everything you, it's, he's just waiting for you to do something wrong. What we found is that these individuals have the worst mental health outcomes. They have the least likelihood of change in mental health treatment. When we've looked at uh, populations that are in distress, so when you look at uh, mental health court populations, when you look at uh, individuals that are, are involved in psychiatric care, the largest group of these four will be the critical God group. It has been in every population we've looked at. In fact, we actually wonder at this point if what happens is when people do go into stress, they actually may change their perspective because they may, many of them may think they're being punished by God. And so, uh, so what we're doing is we're trying to uh, come up with an instrument for, for any therapist to be able to assess these in any client very quickly, regardless of their faith tradition. Uh, and that's really what's needed. We, this has been demonstrated in, in Muslim groups, it's been demonstrated in Jewish, it's been demonstrated in Christian, it cuts across them which is a, a pretty interesting thing. So it's that engagement dimension that's important. So therapeutically, spirituality and faith are an important thing in, in uh, mental health care. We know logistically they're going to faith communities first, so that's a great place to be able to help them access mental health care. So if we, if we look at it from a spiritual perspective, for instance, uh, as people of faith, you know, we may believe that it is a, a good idea for people to grow spiritually when they're trying to recover from mental health issues. I think one of the first things that a, a spiritual or faith perspective offers to mental health care, that which mental health care has lost over the years, is what I would call a holistic view of the person. I think, unfortunately, uh, we our mental health care system, which is very dysfunctional and uh, has lost a sense of the person being more than just a body. And so we're very, you know, I, I love medication. I got a you know, PhD in neuroscience. I've been studying the brain for, you know, ever. So medication is great. It's a great tool, but it's just a tool. And, uh, and I've never seen a client just take medication and that was all they ever needed and everything was rainbow and sunshine after that. I mean, they need more than that. Every study that's ever been done with medication and therapy showed that therapy and medication together works better than either one alone. And certainly there are plenty of studies that show that therapy by itself can be effective. Uh, and so medication is just a tool, but we tend to kind of focus on the physical aspects of mental illness or simply just the mental aspects, but we really don't tend to take a, a holistic approach to caring for the person where you say, this affects you physically, this affects you mentally, this affects your relationships. And if you're a person of faith, it also affects you spiritually because it's going to affect how you interact with God, how you interact with your faith community, how you interact with others, which then gets into the relational aspect. And so taking a holistic approach, I think that's what bringing in faith and spirituality allows. So, for instance, just a month ago, I was at MHMR giving a, a, a much more data-driven, kind of, were you all there? I oh, okay. Was given a, I gave a very similar kind of, were you there? 
Oh, okay. It was a lunch I'm thing. Oh, okay. It was a lunch thing. It was the therapist and psychiatrist. Okay. I mean, and so I've been working with them to, they're, they're going to maybe be involved in the development of this instrument. And they asked me to come in and do a, a lunchtime kind of discussion on this because they have said, they ha are asked so commonly about faith in the therapeutic sessions and they don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to incorporate that. They don't know how to use that. They don't, so they'd, they'd like some better understanding of how they might do that. My reaction is very similar in past days and stuff like that. And I use it as a work group. Mm -hmm. They think New Age. That's exactly right. They think Eastern faith. And, and the reality is, is that, you know, holistic is a, it is a word that has really kind of been taken by that more, more of an Eastern or New Age type of thing. And I, I like to use the term because I think terms really are neutral and def de de definitional. And so I like that term. My wife says the same thing. She says, you need to stop using that term because you're scaring everybody away. But I think taking this perspective is something that adding in faith and spirituality uh, allows you to do. And so, uh, you know, I mean, when I work with, what I do is, for instance, I, when I work with Christian pastors, I'll, I'll use a verse like this, and I'll say, you know, this is where I get this kind of four-part aspect, and that is, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. He grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. And so, you know, whether you believe it's four or five or two or one, certainly, our scriptures talk about us in more than physical terms. And so that's something we can all agree on. And we certainly need to, to take into account if a person sees themselves as a spiritual person, as a person of faith. I, I told the MHMR people this the other day. You know, I used to tell, I was for 12 years, I was, in a, uh, I was in a clinical program where I was teaching clinical doctoral students. And I, you know, I would tell them the same thing. If your client is sitting there and you never ask them about their faith, and you never engage them in a discussion of their faith, and they believe that the reason they have depression is because God is punishing them, they will never get better. Period. They're never getting better. I don't care what you do. If they believe that and you don't know that, they're never going to get better. And so, you know, a lot of times this, it doesn't matter what the therapist believes, it's what the individual who's ill believes. And so if they see themselves as a spiritual person, and they, and they see that this is a, is, has spiritual roots to it, whether you believe that or not or whether it does or not, you need to know that. And I think by incorporating faith and spirituality into mental health care, I think that brings in that kind of more holistic approach where we think about people as more than just the physical. Now, what we do here, we take a very holistic approach here at the Hope and Healing Center, and kind of what I would consider a holistic approach is you work with an individual, so you know an individual is affected fully by a mental health issue. So we work on physical needs, we work on mental needs with them, we would go through spiritual needs with them and also relational needs. And so what's nice about that and another thing, another reason that I really promote that to clinicians is, let's say that, you know, in a traditional mental health care, you get psychotherapy and medication. And maybe you get some structured support Maybe. If you have a really good clinician, they send you to a support group and your family to a support group, but probably not. So you get medication and psychotherapy, okay? Well, let's say things aren't going so well. You're not doing well right now. You're not managing your symptoms well and you're struggling, okay? Well, you have psychotherapy and medication. Okay, so we change your medication. You're still not doing well. But when you take more of a holistic approach, what you can say is, well, I understand that you're struggling right now, but you know what? Let's work, on, let's work on resolving conflict. I know you've been having some problems with your mom or whoever. We can work on that, and you can maybe get some progress in that. Or let's work on, uh, on some spiritual growth things. Let's, let's help you grow in your intimacy with God. I know you've been asking questions about that. It gives you a whole lot, mo whole lot of more opportunities in which you can say, there are other things we can work on, and there are other strengths and opportunities where you can grow we don't have to just worry about the specific set of symptoms that we've been focusing on with whatever. And so a holistic approach gives you a broader opportunity. And again, I think faith and spirituality give you that kind of holistic approach. Now, this probably should have been the first thing, and this is just a verse that I, well, this is actually a paraphrase of a verse, but I think that what faith and spirituality probably most importantly bring in the context of a spiritual context here is they offer hope. They offer a hope 
that transcends circumstances. I know as somebody who's worked with clients for 20 years, if all I have to offer the client is my, my hope that their symptoms will get better, what if they don't? I've had lots of clients that the, that the symptom they came in to see, the major problem they were having, and I don't mean like they have bipolar, I mean whatever the clinical issue was in the moment, that that particular issue didn't ever get any better. Now they got a lot better, their quality of life increased and they were dealing with their illness better, but they may still be dealing with negative thinking. They still may be, I mean I had a, I had a young woman with schizoaffective disorder, she had uh, she, we were in almost, we, it took us uh, over a year to get her voices under control. I mean, she had voices every single day for a year. And that was what she, that was what she originally came for because she was really struggling with that. If, you know, how long does it take you to quit when you have no hope that you're ever going to get any better? Not very long. And so what faith and spirituality bring you is a hope that transcends circumstances. It gives you a kind of a foundational explanation of why you're suffering, which is probably some type of brokenness in the world. And then it gives you, just like with that, we talked about a minute ago about the idea of an engaged God. It gives you, if you're, if you're believing in an engaged God that is, it, he's engaged because he cares, then that hope transcends whatever circumstance you're in, okay? And most faiths kind of teach that, and that is that God will be present with you throughout your struggles or your suffering. And that he will be there for you. And so I think, you know, I think possibly this is the most important aspect, in, in, particularly in the spiritual aspect of these things, that you have a hope that transcends circumstances. Certainly for the families, I think this is int very important because I have worked with more than one family where the family member, the mother or father was told by a clinician, your child will never get any better than they are. This is it. You know, they have schizophrenia, they have bipolar disorder with psychosis. This is the best you're ever going to have for them. I mean, again, that's not a hope-filled message. And, I, and when I'm, I'm not saying lie to people, but I'm also saying that, you know, the having symptoms is not a full definition of what it is to live. A person can live beyond their illness. A person can still have a good quality of life. And so that's what I think another thing that's uh, offered here. And then I think finally in the spiritual context, I think that, one of the things you find is that, you know, there's personal spiritual growth. And so both for the individual who's struggling, but also for the people that are involved with the individual. And, you know, this is just one kind of verse from the Bible that kind of gives you the idea that, that by serving those who suffer, we're actually caring, we're, we're help, we're interacting with God in a very intimate way. And there's plenty of verses that say during our suffering, God is transforming us and drawing us closer to him. And so I think that there's a personal spiritual growth aspect of this also. So if you think about it, we've got, you know, kind of, again, kind of three levels of, of why it's important, I think, to incorporate it. One being logistical, which I think is the most obvious. No one can argue with that. Uh, I mean, and, and what you find is, you know, people would love to figure out, they've never really done it, but they'd love to figure out how is the best way to get those referrals made. Uh, the churches or the faith communities have been very resistant to that. And, and, you know, one of the problems related to that may be this, and that's the over-spiritualization of uh, mental health issues. Okay, there's a real problem. This is really why I ever got into this. I, I really never intended to ever be standing here in charge of this organization. I, I was an aggression and impulse control researcher. I was also a person of faith. I've been studying violence my entire life, working with violent populations. But as a person of faith and being a mental health care provider, I would be in churches and someone would pull me aside when they found out what I did. They want to ask me questions and they would ask me questions about their mental health issue or their children's mental health issues. And many times those questions were spiritual in nature. They would they would ask me, you know, what did I, you know, did you know, do I think it's demonic? Do I think that, you know, or the pastor told me that there's no such thing as bipolar disorder. I just need to pray more and that that'll make it go away. And I mean, I've, I mean, I can, I mean, I wrote two whole books on this. I can give you just, I can just go on all night telling you all the things people told me. And that really started to bother me, okay? Because first off, I was completely naive to that world. I had never heard anybody say those kind of things. And so I started to look into that. And that's why I started this whole separate line of research around this. Now, this is actually from a study, another study done by Lifeway about three years ago where they actually asked people, uh, 
about, well, actually this was a subset of another study that had nothing to do with mental illness. They asked a few questions about mental illness. And what they were looking at were the beliefs among what you would think of as very conservative Christians, or what a lot of times in the media is kind of thought of as right-wing kind of Christians. You know, So people that self-identified as born-again Christian or an evangelical Christian or a fundamentalist Christian. So they have very orthodox beliefs, okay? And, and this is a very disturbing statistic here. And uh, I mean, it, I've shown this a million times. A uh, guy who gathered this day is a good friend of mine. I mean, it's a very disturbing statistic. With Bible study and prayer alone, people with serious mental illness like depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia can overcome mental illness. 48% of people in that very orthodox group said that that was true. I mean, that is disturbing, okay? I mean, and first off, you have to understand that, you know, I would imagine most of those people are not pastors, but if the congregants in the pew think that, you can almost be sure that the pastor thinks that. And going back to the very first thing I told you, people are more likely to go to a pastor. Well, they don't tend to, like, go up to the door and go, can I, like, see your doctrinal statement real quick before I ask you some questions about my mental illness? They just go to whoever's close. And if they go to this person and they say, well, I, you know, I'm really struggling with this or that, or, or a mental health care provider diagnosed me with bipolar disorder, I'm not really sure what I should do, the response they're going to get is what we have found in our research. Whoops. Oh, I thought I had it on there. I guess I didn't. But I thought I had another slide there. What, what we have found in our research is that about 30 to 40 percent of those interactions are very negative. And they are told basically one of three things, which is there's no, s all, of the, the, all of them are told there's no such thing as mental illness, and it's caused by, it's one of three things, personal sin, a lack of faith, or the demonic, okay? And so, uh, now I will tell you, you know, I do believe in personal sin, I do believe in lack of faith, and I do believe in the demonic also, okay? But I don't think that they cause schizophrenia. So, so the thing is, is that you, you know, it isn't an exclusionary idea to have certain conservative religious beliefs, and then you also have to, there, there's nothing that makes those go together. I, in fact, I've tried for years to figure out what the theology behind this is, and it's, it's, it's inconsistent. The, uh, many of those same individuals will tell people that they should not take psychiatric medication, um, and so, uh, and we have, we've looked at several large sets of people that were told that, those same people that were told the people that told them not to take psychiatric medication themselves take medication for other things. It's, these are not extremists in faith communities that don't go to doctors or things like that. They just see mental illness or mental health issues as different. So the over-spiritualization of these things is kind of one of the things that undercuts this kind of spiritual aspect of why we should include that. But what I will tell you on the positive side is if you do incorporate spirituality into these things, uh, and it's very easy to do. You get really great benefits. So this is data from a, a, living, grace a living Grace Group study we did. Living Grace Group is a, a curriculum that I developed many years ago at another nonprofit that I was at, which is a group for people that have serious mental illness. It's a faith-based group. It teaches them coping skills and resiliency and, and how to control their uh, symptoms and manage their illness. Uh, and it's, it's a support group, basically. It's, it's facilitated by a peer. Anyone can be trained to, to do it in, in four hours. It takes a four-hour training, and there's a curriculum that they go through. We actually offer this group here on Thursday nights, but these groups are offered in 12 different states and seven different countries right now. Okay, so we've got a ton of data. I had a graduate student do his dissertation on that. That's Ed Rogers, got a little name down there. And what Ed found is this. When you assess individuals with serious mental illness, you have to be diagnosed with a serious mental illness to even be in the group. Before the group and after the group, we have a significant reduction in depression and anxiety symptoms, but the incorporation of spirituality into this gives you something that you don't get in just a secular group, and that is you get an increase in their spiritual growth. You actually get an increase in their spiritual life. They feel closer to God. They feel more connected to God. They feel more loved by God. And then that, I think, is kind of a synergistic thing in that it also helps them be less depressed and anxious. And so you get this real connection there. Something, you know, a secular group that does incorporate spirituality can get the reductions in anxiety and depression and things like that and symptoms. That's great. But for people of faith that are going to these churches to try to get some kind of a comfort or, or understanding, you know, this is a great, what we found in the people that were in these groups is they wanted faith incorporated into their care 
and they weren't satisfied. That's why they'd come to this group. And, and this just kind of gives you kind of this double opportunity. It builds hope. I find it much easier to build hope when a person is a person of faith. Because if you can connect with them in a faith perspective, talk to them about the character of God, that God cares for them, kind of move them from a critical God perspective to more of a benevolent God perspective, it changes everything. They're much, I had a student just recently do his dissertation. We're writing that up now on self-efficacy in God image. And self-efficacy is kind of that, that uh, your, your kind of understanding or ability to believe you can change or, or move forward. And sure enough, he found that it's that engagement dimension. The higher you were on that God engagement dimension, the higher your self-efficacy. So the lower you were, the less likely you believed you could ever change or get better. And again, as we, as we know, if you have a client that doesn't believe they can change, you have to work on that. That's what you have to focus on. You can't work on their illness with them. You have to work on their motivation to change. You have to get them to a point where they believe they actually can get better or they won't get any better. And so, uh, so I think it's a very important component. I think it brings a lot to the table. Now, let's go through a few kind of summarize this, and then what I want to do is I want to kind of show you an initiative that we're going to be kind of laying out across the city to kind of try to show how we might go about doing this. So one of the reasons, as I said, it's the front door of the mental health care system. I like to say it's the front door, but it's also the back end, because it's the front door where you show up first. We know that's what the data shows us. They go there first, but they tend to not get referred. So what if we could get them referred. Well, then they would get to, mental, they get to traditional care, they would get their medication, they would get their therapy, they'd be connected to the mental health care system. And then what happens? Well, they don't stay over here, they come back here. And so what if we could equip faith communities to be a supportive community where support groups were offered and mental health coaches were available and things like that. They were supporting the family and things like that. So they could also be the back end. And that's another thing I think they can offer supportive care and relapse management. Tr uh, faith communities can offer both an entry to the mental health care system and then a long-term supportive care. I mean, I, it, I can tell you right now, as somebody who works with clients, if I know that a client is connected to a supportive faith community that offers support groups that they can go to and they have people there that they can talk to also in addition to me or a psychiatrist, that client's in a much better position than if I know when they leave my office, they go home and they sit by themselves and they have no community, they have no connection, they have no support. So that's a, a wonderful opportunity. Now, the drawback is, and this is something we more recently have been looking at, I just showed you this over-spiritualization. What if the individual is in a faith community that teaches God is a critical God? You know that critical God image? So we've just started to ask that question right now. Uh, I'm working collaboratively with some people still up at Baylor. And our concern would be then that their faith community is actually undermining everything that you're doing because they're teaching that God is judging them and isn't engaged. And, and, and you may think, well, nobody would teach that. You come down to my office later. I can <laughs> I can tell you some voices that teach people that. So I mean, there are there are people that teach that that God is very basically angry at them, and they better perform well, or he's not gonna he's not gonna care for you. And so that could undermine that. So the question begin becomes then, how would you go about if they're a person of faith again? What we're not talking about is a some a person of faith a person that has no faith coming in and you trying to convince them to believe. What we're talking about is people of faith coming in. And I will tell you that the vast majority of people that are involved in any kind of therapy usually bring up spirituality at some point. It just, it just happens. They just bring it up. And so most people in the United States are people of faith at some level. I mean, 90-something plus people believe in, a, in an actual God. And, and then, you know, this Gallup study, a newer one that came out than the one I showed you there, uh, was it seven out of ten Americans self-identify as Christian? So I mean, the thing is, is that you know we're a very religious society. So front door supportive care, therapeutic benefits. We've been talking about that. There's a lot of therapeutic benefits, and I'll give you another one that I didn't mention, and that is a collaborative relationship between a pastor or a faith leader and the mental health care providers. Right now, the way this gatekeeper model is set up is it's a one-directional relationship. The the clergy 
they refer to the mental health care provider and no one ever talk, thought about what happens now with that relationship. The thought is it just disappears. But what if the clergy refers, release of information forms are signed, and now the psychiatrist, the therapist, and the clergy are all working in a team effort to care for that individual? That's a much better approach. In fact, no one in any kind of healing art would argue that a team approach isn't better. And so if the therapist knew what the clergy had been meeting with the individual about, if the clergy knew what the psychiatrist concerns they've been having, if they work together, you have a much better opportunity. And those types of models, we've developed some, they're very effective. They're very, very effective. And for people who want spirituality and faith involved in their care, uh, it's actually only a benefit to them. The holistic perspective, that's another thing that faith uh, brings to this that I think the mental health system has kind of lost. Although I will tell you, they're very open to it. Uh, the, um, as you mentioned, it's actually more the faith communities that get freaked out when you say that. When you say that in the mental health community, they think that's great. You know, the right now I've, is probably the most open I've ever seen the mental health community to issues of spirituality and faith. They're extremely open to that. They, they really have gotten to a point where it's like, we just want them to be better. So we, you know, if faith will help, great. And nobody's asking the therapist to be a per, you change their faith. We're just, you know, you're just incorporating the faith strengths of the person you're working with. Hope that transcends circumstances, like I said before, and then that personal spiritual growth. I think that both for the individual and for the person who's working with them. Uh, but I do think, as I showed with that, with that group data, I do think there's kind of a, a cyclical relationship. I think as the person grows m closer to God, it increases their hope. I think it reduces their stress. Data has shown that. I think that they feel more loved, more cared for, more supported. And then I think, again, you get a reduction in depression and anxiety. I, mean, I think it's a real circular relationship there. So now, how would you do all that? So it's not being done right now. There, nobody is, you know, Miniger is n does not have a whole bunch of phone numbers to different churches in the area, and they call them all the time going, you got anybody to refer to us, and hey, can we come over and train you, and nobody's doing that, okay, but we want to do that, and so we've developed a set of resources, and we have a set of training, and I want to kind of give you an idea of how you might incorporate that in a, in a larger community, and how that might impact the community, and this is what we're going to be kind of laying out over, say, the next five years, so first off, let's just get a sense of what kind of numbers of people we're talking about here. So one out of every, this is the newest data out of NIH, one out of every five Americans in a given year will experience a mental illness, okay? That's a lot of people, okay? So you can see that's about 44 million adults, okay? That is a lot of people. That's way more people than have diabetes. I mean, they're only, if you think about the number of people with diabetes, in fact, who in here knows someone, you don't tell me that you, that you have diabetes, but either you have it or you know somebody who has it, okay? Everybody but one person in the room. Just raise their hand, okay? There are, there are 24, <laughs> th in the United States, there are 24 million children and adults that have diabetes. That's just a number for adults. That doesn't include children, okay? So, so, but it, so if, you <laughs> if you know somebody who has diabetes, you, you obviously know people who have mental illness, too. You know, because if you know someone out of 24 million children and adults, you certainly know someone out of 44 million adults. You add in children, you have a much higher number. And so if you look at serious mental illness, one out of every 25, which is about 13 million. Now, what's serious mental illness? Serious mental illness is pretty much what you think of as mental illness. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, eating disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. I left one out. There's, there's another one. But those are the, basically what you, what you think of as mental illness is what the, is a, the, the, serious mental illness is actually a legal term. It actually means that set. Basically what it means is a lot, of, most everything except substance abuse is pretty much what it means nowadays. And then, not that substance abuse, I, I hate that, I hate that term because then you've got to say, oh, well you have a less serious mental illness. And I'm not sure that that really is real because there are some other things too like phobias, that would be considered a less serious <laughs> disorder. And then this is probably even a more disturbing statistic. Half of all chronic mental illnesses begin by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24. So by the age of 14, half of all people that are going to be bipolar disorder have already started to show symptoms of that. By the age of 24, 
three quarters of all people that are going to be schizophrenic or bipolar disordered or depressed have already started. So we're, we're talking about a young group of people here, okay? And so, again, another reason I think that you're going to see that the faith community involvement is really important and also bringing in some others. So how might we go about that? So what are the barriers? You mentioned barriers earlier, so let's look at a few, because the, the reality is most people, most of those people we just talked about, they never receive any treatment. And I don't mean that they go and get treatment and stop. I mean they literally never get treated. In this country, there are schizophrenics, there are people with bipolar disorder, the most serious of our illnesses, who never get treatment, if you can even imagine. So availability, that's one of our main uh, barriers. And underneath that, the problem with that is there are simply too few male health care providers, and there always have been, and there always will be. There will never be enough male health care providers. Yes? Oh, absolutely. That, yeah, that's going to that's gonna pop up here in just a second. So availability, there's too few, and there's a serious lack of facilities. So one of the reasons I know that there's never going to be enough mental health care providers is we've desperately tried over the last 10 to 20 years to throw a lot of money at training programs to try to get more people to be. Like, so, for instance, if you want to be, like be a therapist and you're willing to go work in a rural area, I can show you how you can get your entire education paid for completely. And the, and the government will pay for it, and then they'll, they will put you in a rural area, and you have to work there for a certain number of years, you know, and then it's like you, ne you never, you have no debt. It's just like if you go into the military, you can get a, I know a guy that went to the military, and he got his entire medical education paid for. He got to, went to medical school, it was all paid for, he then was in the military for many years as a physician, it didn't, didn't have to pay a penny. So, the thing is, we've been trying to do this for years. But the reason I know we're never going to have enough is because we've also been trying to do that with nurses, and we've been trying to do it a lot longer. And it doesn't take as long. And what we've done is we've dramatically altered the training necessary for a nurse to try to... So there was a time, if you wanted to be a nurse, you had to go to a, a college and get a nursing degree. Okay, well, then we changed that. And, they, and then now virtually every junior college has a nursing program. You don't even have to have an undergraduate degree now to get an RN. You just go into a nursing program. They're everywhere. We've, we've done everything to try. We, we, there used to be no such thing as LPNs, uh, or I'm sorry, LVNs and all those kind of, we tried all that. We tried sub-levels of nursing. We still, if you open up the Chronicle on Sunday, you will see nursing ads from other cities in the Chronicle because there is such a shortage of nurses. And we've done everything we can. There's just simply... It's a, good, it's a good time to be a nurse. That's what I tell, I tell women all, all the time that come and say, I'm not sure what I want to do. Hey, go be a psychiatric nurse. You'll have a job forever. I mean, there, there is such shortage of psychiatric nurses, it's not even funny. So too few mental health care providers, serious lack of facilities. The state of Texas has now cut significant funding for community mental health clinics, and they're pushing all the money back into institutions. So we're kind of pulling everything back into these, I these big, giant institutions, like these classic psych hospitals. Very few facilities. There are, in the state of Texas, of the 200 and, say, 50-something counties that we have in the state of Texas, 204 are deemed to be lacking in mental health care providers, if you can even imagine. Virtually every one of them, which is crazy. Accessibility. People don't have transportation, limited financial resources, Anybody ever been to Minninger? <laughs> okay. They don't take insurance. It's all cash pay. And that is the movement in psychiatry and psychology now. Now, the reason for that is not because psychiatrists and psychologists are terrible people and they want to take your money. The reason for that is insurance has, in the past, barely paid for mental health care. In fact, that's why just recently, in fact, I think it was just last year, that Obama signed into... Uh, signed into effect this kind of equalization act that actually President Bush had started. If you can even imagine, he, it was written during the time he was the president, but they could never get it through Congress. And all it says is that an insurance company will pay equally for mental health care as it does for traditional physical care, that they won't undercut it. So all of that time from the Bush era 
to Obama just last year, it has been working its way through Congress. They wouldn't vote it. They wouldn't approve it. And they just last year, they approved it. So there's supposed to be an equivalency uh, within that. And so you should hopefully see better pay for that. But right now, the pay's been pretty bad. So most, a lot of psychiatrists have a good friend in Waco that's a psychiatrist. He doesn't take any insurance. One of the clinics that we refer to here in town, that's one of our favorite referrals, great clinic, great psychologist, they don't take any insurance. You have to pay out of pocket. Miniger, out of pocket, they don't take any insurance. Now, who can afford that? Only the elite can afford that, okay? So private residential psychiatric care, if you, not acute care, which is what most care is, cost, can cost anywhere from thirty to $50,000 a month if you can even imagine. So imagine that your loved one needs to be in a psychiatric facility for three months and it costs $50,000 a month, but and they don't take any insurance. You know, so, uh, so it's, you know, and then lack of knowledge and education, people just don't understand that they need to get care. Strangely enough, they, they decide that, well, this is something that we can handle in the family or, or I can just work on myself. And then acceptability, and that's where stigma comes in and cultural beliefs. Uh, cultural beliefs are very strong. In fact, if you look at some data like this, which is really frightening across the board, uh, this is from the federal government, but this is from 2010. They're always several years behind on their data. But what you find, this is the most up-to-date data, for all adults with a diagnosed serious mental illness, only 39% in the year prior to 2010 received treatment. So that means that the majority of people with an illness got no treatment. So now, you break that down ethnically, you might go, oh, well, you know, maybe the more affluent groups are getting care, or maybe it's an ethnic breakdown or whatever. It, these, this really isn't as big of a difference as it may look. Okay, so 44% of whites received some care, okay? That still means that a huge chunk, yeah, less than half, over half didn't receive any. You see blacks and Hispanics about the same. This is, has always been and probably always will be the worst ethnicity when it comes to accessing care. And it's because it's an honor-based culture, and honor-based cultures are notorious at not accessing any kind of outside care because whereas in black and Hispanic communities, there's a, a greater cultural stigma associated with mental illness, you don't have family members actively working against the person trying to keep them from care, whereas in Asian groups you do. They, you know, it's, it's literally the mother and the father saying, we can't take her to get care, that'll shame our whole family. You know, and so, again, it's just a very different cultural phenomenon. Uh, it's really much, very much like that in um, uh, Indian, uh, like Hindu Indian populations. I had two Indian students, and one of them actually did a big study in, in, uh, in the Indian culture, and oh, an incredible level of shame. I mean, family members literally keeping people from going to get care because so w the family would be shamed by the situation. Right. Right. Yeah, no, and Buddhism has, Buddhism has been incorporated into a number of, particularly the, you know, mindfulness aspects, been incorporated in a lot of care, but it, when you look at, you know, they just don't. Now, what they may do, what they may do is they may, much like what you find with the other thing, is they may then connect with their faith. They may go to a Buddhist temple, they may go to a Buddhist uh, leader, and then they may feel like they get some, and I think they do get relief from that, but that doesn't count as mental health treatment. And so, so what you're going to find in all of these, and has been found in all of these, is all of these people are more likely to go to whoever they see as their faith leader, particularly if you think about these minority populations. I mean, if you go into a predominantly African-American community, the church is more than just a religious center. I mean, it is a, it's a social center. I mean, it's a cultural center. And, you know, one of the problem, one of the mistakes that's been made in the past, and this is the, this model that I'm going to show you in a minute that we're going to be laying out, is, you know, Miniger decides to go down to Sunnyside and build a new Miniger clinic. In, well, we'll just build one right there. Then they can just walk to it, you know. Well, they walk right past it on the way to the church is what they do. And everybody does that. It, it, they've built clinics. Ev they've tried this everywhere across the country. They've tried it in every, you know, they've tried it in white communities and black communities and Spanish. This doesn't work. 
Y you can build it in their house, and they, nobody wants to say, I have a mental illness. And if you walk in the front door of the Minniger Clinic, you have to at least say, I'm having enough problems that I think I need to go here. And there's a huge stigma. So stigma is, if you look at the, when surveys are done of why you did not get care, because as you can tell from this, it's very easy to get populations or samples that say, I never got any care. When you ask them why, stigma and finances are the two, they go, they just jump back and forth depending on the survey. And believe it or not, stigma winds up number one more often than finances. So if even people with finances will not go get care because they're of the stigma and the shame that's associated. So let me talk to you a little bit about this, this community mental health initiative that we're going to try to lay out over the next few years as we're, as we're able to gather funds for it. So the, the thought is this. Let's play, the, let's play the percentages, okay? We know that people are more likely to go to faith communities first. I didn't find that. Lots of people have found that. That's just a known fact, okay? So if we know they're going there first, and we know that people are looking at clergy as gatekeepers, let's really make them effective gatekeepers. Let's offer the faith communities in the Houston area, let's, let's proactively go out to them and say, we will train you to recognize mental health problems and how to make an effective referral, and we will serve as a connection point between you and the mental health community. So if you have somebody that comes in and you recognize that they have a problem and you think they need a referral, We'll help you know how to make a referral, and if you can't find a referral, you can call us, and we'll help you get that person to a mental health care provider. Uh, so that's, that's one aspect of it. So one part is mental health training. So our goal is to go out into the Houston community and to engage uh, 200 faith communities and to train them to effectively recognize and make referrals, okay? Another aspect of that is support groups, okay? Some churches, they... They may, or some faith communities, they may be willing to let NAMI come in, or DBSA, or AA, or just have a night where they have these different groups offered. So what that would mean is at the end of your block where your faith community is, there's a whole set of support groups that have already been shown to be effective at helping people manage their symptoms, okay? I mean, research has shown that even if a caregiver of a person with a mental health problem, this person is receiving no care, if this caregiver has gone, goes into a psychoeducational group, this person shows better mental health outcomes. They actually show improvement just because they're caregiver. So what about offering a DBSA caregiver group and offering a DBSA group or a NAMI group? Now maybe some churches or some faith communities want to offer their own groups. Well, we have curricula already developed. They're faith-based curricula. I showed you some data there. They help reduce symptoms. We have one for caregivers. We have one for people with serious mental illness. We have one for people with trauma. We can train them to offer that. So what we've done with those faith communities is we have made them a real front door to the system and we've made them a supportive community on the back end. Another aspect of this is mental health coaches. One of the things we lack in the mental health care system is we only have providers at the highest level. We only have credentialed, licensed providers. We don't have anything below that, really. I mean, there has been a movement to try to get peer counselors going, but it seems to be dying out, and I think it was a great movement. And that's what mental health coaches are. Mental health coaches are, are people without, they don't have a pro professional credential, but they've been given training, and they work through a curriculum with someone to help them gain skills and tools and, and build resiliency and learn coping strategies. And they help the person manage their illness, but they also serve as an advocate for the person to make sure that they are you know, getting to their psychiatric care, make sure they're going to their therapist, make sure that their family is finding out information about what's going on and everybody knows what, you know. So they're serving as an advocate, which is very common now in medicine. It's a new movement in cancer treatment, for instance, is uh, cancer advocates that walk people through the system. So that's what mental health coaches do. We have a program where we can train someone to be a mental health coach. And some of those churches might want to have a mental health coach on their pastoral care team or a one of their pastors trained as a mental health coach. And so we could have in those, in those faith communities trained staff that are going to recognize mental illness, make a referral. On the back end, people that can help people manage their illness, support groups that can support them. And so now we have a real functional system there. Another thing we want to do is we want to put a set of recovery homes around the community. These are residential facilities where someone could come and stay up to two months that has a mental health problem 
and they would be working with mental health coaches. They'd be living there. They'd be working with mental health coaches 24-7. They would be, uh, have their families come in. They'd be doing, working together with their families. But they'd be, be, be kind of immersed in a recovery lifestyle of how to manage your symptoms, how to maintain stability, all of that kind of stuff. And what it would do is it would sit as an a intermediary between the family and acute hospitalization. I mean, right now, if you have a mental health problem and you go to, I mean, I refer people all the time over to the Bel Air Psych Hospital. It's great. It's great. You know, for acute care, it's great. Okay, and they take insurance. So they, there's my plug. So, uh, <laughs> so, the, uh, so the thing is, is that, you know, if I, if I send you over there, on average, what the data tells us from the nation is that you're going to stay three to four days and then you're going to be back out. So let's say you're overtly suicidal, and I send you there. The data, national data show, tells us that you're going to be out, and you're going to be back with your family in three to four days, okay? So what if there was an intermediate place that when you started to show problems, instead of putting you straight in the hospital, you could go there and maybe keep yourself from getting hospitalized, or after you were hospitalized, an intermediate that allows you time to work with your family and assimilate you back into your home, and so this is what we hope to do with recovery homes and have a, a set of them. And again, they're staffed by non-professionals that have had training. But, you know, so for instance, what's happening every day is, you know, they're taking you to your psychiatric appointment. They're taking you to your therapy. But then you're also getting work right there in the home, okay? So, and then finally, education and awareness seminars. Once we activate those uh, or equip those faith communities, and I'm going to tell you we're going to be doing some doing businesses and doing school districts too, we, uh, we then offer regularly throughout that community network a set of education awareness seminars to get people talking about mental health issues as if they are normal issues. So stigma starts to be broken and people realize they can come. Like one of the things I have been doing is going into churches around the country that, wanna, that are interested in doing this and what they'll do is they'll have a they'll have a mental health seminar and they'll advertise it to the community. Come to our church and learn about mental health issues and services that are offered. And then basically what the whole community knows now is that that faith community is a safe place for people with mental health issues to go and be supported. So what does this look like? So if that's us up there, the HHCI, and here's the psychology world and there's the psychiatric world, and we're already connected. We have a big network uh, and we refer people all the time for psychiatric medication or psychological therapy. The blue dots there are different faith communities that have been empowered. You can see some have mental health care providers, some have, I'm sorry, some have mental health coaches, some have support groups, some have both. We have some recovery homes that we're overseeing in the community. The faith communities that we go out and train, not all of them have to be involved at the same level. All of them have to have their staff trained to recognize mental health problems and know how to make a referral. Some of them will offer support groups. Some of them won't. Some of them will have mental health coaches. Some of them won't. As long as all of them are involved at some level, then you start to get a supportive framework. Then what we want to do is we want to also add in large businesses. So we go into a business and we say, look, I will come in. I'll do one hour training with all of your, all of your uh, employees. Right now, you're paying a fortune for mental health problems that are not getting treated. Okay. So, and you're getting people that, you know, people that are not coming to work because they have to stay home and take care of their mentally ill wife or whatever. Let us come in. Let us break stigma. Let us, let us make it safe for them to come to us and say, we can get you the care you need. Then let us set up in your, in your business some support groups where they can get the care right here. They'll come to work and then they go to the support group right after work or whatever. Maybe you want to have in your HR pro department someone trained as a mental health coach that can try to assess whether somebody needs to go get extra care. We also are going to go to s uh, school systems and say the same thing. We have teen versions of many of these support groups that we offer. And when I say teen versions, I mean it's a teen version led by a teen, okay? It, it's so a teen can actually lead it. A teen can lead a group for people with illness. And so that gives them support right there, a safe opportunity to talk about their illness. But when teacher, teachers are also looked at as a gatekeeper, uh, teachers are ones who can see that early on. But a lot of times teachers aren't trained, and they're also, they may see something, but they're not trained how to, in a sense, pull the trigger of what to do about it. They usually let somebody 
that really doesn't know, I mean, there might be within the entire system of the school, you know, some set of school counselors that focus more around educational things, and that information goes there, but it never goes anywhere. Or they might say something to them, well, I think maybe you ought to take your child and have them assessed. Well, if that family has, I mean, all those barriers are the same problems that families have, and they may not have any insurance or money. They don't even know what that means. What does that mean, assessed? What does that mean? I don't so, you know, they, you, you have to educate people more than that. So if, if the school is equipped to do that, then I think you have a better. And since we know that half are already set in place by 14, we certainly want to be intervening early. Want to be intervening early. So this is what that then looks like. So imagine this for a minute. So without all these dots and all of these squares and triangles and us, there's just the psychology world and the psychiatry world, and you have to find your way there if you're ill. Whereas what we're saying is, let's put services and let's put advocates and let's put training right into your neighborhood. And, uh, and the, mo the best part of all this, all of that, will cost you nothing. You won't have to pay to go to the support group at your church. You won't have to pay to go talk to your pastor. You won't have to pay at your business when you go talk to the HR person and they recognize you have a mental health problem, they refer you to a support group or whatever because it's all free service. So now you're getting, at least at some level, some care, and then we're also getting you connected with mental health care, also getting you connected. My hope would be this, if what this would do in an area like Houston is it would reduce hospitalizations, psychiatric hospitalizations, we have other options now for short-term stays, okay? Actually, these would cost, but these wouldn't. Not what a hospital cost, but it would cost. And then, um, and th by reducing hospitalization, then you ultimately would be able to reduce health costs because there just wouldn't be as many people going into the hospital. So that's the thought. This is what we're gonna be trying to kind of roll out over the next uh, couple of years. And then, once we have the data from here in Houston, then we hope to try to implement this nationwide where we would then kind of take the model of the Hope and Healing Center and say, well, if you'd like to impact mental health care in your community, let us show you how to set up a Hope and Healing Center in your community, and then we'll give you the resources and the model, and you can change mental health care in your community. You can do it. We don't have to do it for you. We'll show you how you can do it. And then they do it in Dallas, and they do it in San Francisco, and they do it everywhere, and then we have a functional mental health care system.